Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Kurt Schuler from our Terrace IP, who's going to talk today about some of the big changes that are going on in the automotive industry. So, Kurt, obviously we've seen some big changes going on across the automotive industry with the electrification of cars, much more electronic content. We're moving toward autonomous driving eventually and certainly more assisted driving in the short term. What's happening with that? How, what kinds of changes are you seeing? So there's uh, big changes now in the chips as far as, you know, who owns the architecture of the chips. And what that's doing is it's forcing IP vendors and semiconductor vendors to work with very different people than who they've worked with in the past. So why don't you draw this out for us? Sure thing. So what are we looking at here, Kurt? So if we were to look at in the past uh, in automotive, uh, when you're looking at it from a semiconductor vendor's perspective, you're primarily dealing with the tier ones. So you're delivering chips to the tier ones. And the tier ones are folks like Bosch and Denso and Magna and Delphi, ZF, those companies. And the tier one in return is giving you requirements. And in many cases, in, in the, the semi side of things, there's a, a lot of ASIC business going back and forth where the semiconductor vendors were doing custom or pseudo custom chips for the, for the tier ones. And the IP vendors dealt with the semiconductor vendors just as we traditionally do. Um, now, what has happened here are a couple of things. So as these systems have become more complex, more hardware and software, actuators, multiple types of chips and boards into a system, uh, this is for ADAS and things that go beyond just, just simple uh, sensing and actuating, but actual thinking. What has happened is that um, there's been a, a competition between the semiconductor vendors and the tier ones over who owns the architecture for that overall system, which means who owns the architecture of the chip, who designs the chip. And this is the same problem that we've been talking about for a while, right? Which is when you finally get to autonomous vehicles, what differentiates one from another? Who owns that? Correct. That's a big issue because, you know, the biggest fear of the OEMs or the tier ones who make a lot of the um, subsystems, you know, your braking, your engine, your transmission for the OEMs, these guys do not want to be the Foxconn of cars. So they don't want to be just somebody who blindly assembles whatever is specified by somebody else in the system. So there's a competition now as far as who's going to own that architecture. What does this do, though, in terms of you think about chips and go back to the old Intel days where they owned all the interfaces that would go into those chips? Do they start becoming vendor specific now? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, right now, there's a lot of different uh, there's a lot of work being done throughout, throughout the automotive supply chain to standardize on more things. There's uh, some SAE standards, for example, on security. There's uh, functional safety, ISO 26262 and uh, ISO uh, 21448. Um, there's, the good thing is, is when we're at the chip side of things, there are some standard interfaces for uh, transaction protocols and how IP within the chip hooked up. Of course, there's a thousand and one interfaces for the die to die interfaces or the chip to chip interfaces. Um, and there's more and more interfaces for to different types of memory that are required on these things. So um, it's not like there's one thing. It's not like an Intel who's saying, okay, we're going to create PCI and bam, you know, open up 10, fa uh, 10 factories that create PCI motherboards and make that a standard overnight. That's not how it works. It's, it's more collaborative. So does this really affect anything in terms of the design of the interconnect, the network on chip, uh, or is it still the same system that's going to work, but now you have to think about more things that are going on there? Well, there's actually two issues with it when it comes to the chip architecture. So if you're a semiconductor vendor um, or a design team within one of these folks, your, your architecture of your system um, is expressed uh, by what the chips are capable of doing. And the architecture of the chip, the implementation of that is the on-chip interconnect. Um, you can have two different chip companies who have the exact same IP uh, bill of materials that they licensed from ARM and, and Cadence and Synopsys, maybe even did a little bit themselves. But the big changes between those two architectures of those chips are going to be how it's organized on the chip. And that is the network on chip interconnect. Are you seeing the same kind of talent that you would expect out of a regular uh, SOC vendor? Because these guys are sort of new to the electronic side at the same time the, the 
chip guys are new to the automotive side? Um, the short answer is it's getting there. So with um, if you look at in a parallel um, value chain, if you look at uh, what we've seen on the data center side with the Googles and the Amazons and the Facebooks um, and Apples, they have a ton of money to spend, right? So they've created some world-class chip design teams from scratch. Um, what has happened is that whether you're a, a, um, uh, a Bosch or a Continental or um, some of these other folks in here, these tier ones are hiring uh, chip design folks. Maybe they're only front end people, maybe it's ar architecture and they're gonna have some implementation done somewhere else, but they're hiring world-class people. On top of that, you got the OEMs, um, and it could be directly the OEMs, somebody like a Ford, it could be GM, it could be GM through the wholly owned subsidiary Cruise. Um, they are also hiring chip architects. And we know for a fact that some of these tier ones you know, have gone to their, to their board of directors and said, hey, we want to invest a few billion dollars in designing our own chips. It's hard to find the right talent for this, though, right? I mean, you you not the the design of this is actually one of the easier side on the front end. It's the verification of this and the debug. That's part of it. Um, the part of it too, I would say, is how do you know your architecture is going to be performant for what you want? Um, when we're working with um, these customers, uh, they usually have some pretty good. Um, architecture folks, but it's translating that architecture into a system on chip that will actually meet the requirements from a, a and power is, is very important power consumption because you're, 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 you have a, a, a TDP envelope that you have to meet within these cars, but also you have some near real time requirements crashing into, you know, some of that AI big data, huge bandwidth requirements. And so we work really closely with the architects to help them because the way you modulate that within your architecture is how you set up your on-chip interconnect. And you, so that on-chip interconnect, you can think of it as, um, you know, do you have uh, between an initiator and target that have huge bandwidth? Well, yeah, you wanna have um, uh, interstate uh, five or a, you know, a US 101 really wide path in there. Uh, well, how you meet those requirements is by setting up the interconnect to be able to do that. One of the problems with these chips is they are very sophisticated and there are different use cases. Um, if you imagine in your world, imagine you, you wake up in the morning and you're going to go to work and uh, everybody from your suburb is going into the city to go to work. Well, if you were to optimize the roads just for that use case, you would have you know, four or five, six lanes going from your suburb into the big city to go to work. That's one use case. However, um, there's another use case. Everybody needs to get home in the evening. So when everybody tries to get home on that one lane road going back rather than the four or five or six, traffic gets backed up. So what these architects have to do on the chip for these different use cases is they have to look at all the data flow communication that's going on. And then they're able to meet that data flow by creating where they need to, very wide expressways, and uh, where they can get away with alleys, suburban roads, um, uh, um, you know, things like that. So the architects are thinking along those lines. And when they go along, when once they figure out what the communication has to be within the hardware, uh, they use the interconnect to implement that. Not only that, they're using the interconnect and the uh, simulation built into it and the analytical capability built into the interconnect configuration cockpit to do that analysis for themselves. Basically what's happening is these companies are building their own platforms and these platforms are to some extent future-proofed. But are we now going to see this is going to be minimum performance that they are going to have for the future? Or are we actually going to see massive improvements like we're going to see in the rest of the semiconductor industry? Um, I think a mix of both. So the platform capability is very important. And the reason is from a system level standpoint, you know, we're in the hardware side of things. And that's one element of this. Um, but the, the big cost to them is on the software side of things. So even though they may, let's say, create a chip that's a, a high, medium, and low version of a particular product, you know, as part of a platform, um, they want to keep that software build uh, the same. So for the people who are using a platform strategy, um, what they're trying to do is create a platform that's going to last a certain amount of time. Maybe it's two years, three years, four years. Um, but 
be able to add and take off capabilities from a software standpoint, as well as from a, hey, I can make minor, or not minor, but I can, I can upgrade uh, the near real time uh, object uh, detection capabilities of this chip over time. Um, so that's what they want to be able to do. Ideally, they'd like to have a, a platform that's kind of like, here's our chassis for what this ADAS chip is going to look like or what this uh, sensor chip is going to look like um, uh, and reuse that over multiple sets of designs. Are there radical differences between the designs that are coming out of these different OEMs or are they pretty much the same with minor tweaks? They're totally different. And you, you see... Um, on the high end for the leading edge companies, if you look at the block diagrams, they look nothing alike. Even though they're trying to do similar things, uh, there's some systems that are maybe more visual focused, some systems that, hey, you know, that they've set it up so uh, not in addition to vision, they, they, they have built in uh, uh, sensor fusion capabilities for what's coming from LIDARs or from radars. Uh, you have lower end systems that might share a same type of uh, chassis, if you will, same type of architecture, but it's, it's, it's nothing like what we see with like application processors and mobile phones where, you know, all the block diagrams pretty much look the same or digital baseband modems, you know, for, for LTE or Wi-Fi chips where they, they all look the same. It's not like that at all in automotive. Do you foresee a time when you're going to see chip, uh, chip makers, challenging some of the big OEMs in automotive. So what, what's the base platform here? Is it really the uh, chassis for the automotive or is it the chassis for the electronics? Well, that's the interesting thing because it hasn't been decided yet. People compete in different ways. So uh, for example, there's one company in here, uh, Mobileye, right? And so they create kind of a, a custom system that envelops all of this from a software and also data standpoint. So um, they are deciding everything in here and they even tell their OEMs, oh, Mr. OEM, you know, you're going to use this system. That's great. You know, we're working with Delphi or whatever to, to customize it for you. But guess what? Me as Mobileye, I get access to that data that comes from the system. So remember these systems, for example, the Mobileye stuff, they're getting all this nav data, all of this uh, information on mapping and t putting that into the cloud, their own database and using that to uh, make the product better for every customer who's using a mobilized system. Um, so there's, there's fights over that data. There's fights over what goes into the system in the car. Um, and uh, different companies have different ways of doing it. So Mobileye has one way of doing it. Um, if you look at some of the other uh, companies like um, uh, NXP, you know, what they'll do is they'll provide you a, 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 reference design, an SDK, you know, all these different things. And it's pretty open and you can do a lot of different things with it. And you as a tier one or an OEM have a lot more flexibility uh, with that. So um, there's a lot of different ways. Those are like two ends of the spectrum of how, how to deal with this in automotive. And we won't really know for what, 10, 15 years, which is the best approach, right? Because this all takes time to work itself out. It's going to take a long time. And I imagine there's going to be swings back and forth between more integration and more more uh, horizontalization. You know, more vertical, less vertical. So um, if you look at um, PCs, you know, things started off very vertical and became more horizontal as things commoditized. And you had innovation at different layers. You know, you had their, at the motherboard layer, the CPU layer, the GPUs. Then as the innovation starts dying, they, they verticalize again and, you know, GPUs end up being put back onto the high value things like the CPUs. Um, uh, and, and that will swing back and forth in automotive, I think. So if you're a semiconductor company, do you need to be working with each one of these? Do you really have to hedge across all of these? Yes, you do. I mean, if, if you're a semiconductor company, you need to be talking directly to Ford and GM and BMW and Mercedes. Um, if you're not doing that, you're wrong. Uh, the reason is because they are taking more active interest in defining what these architectures are and the requirements for the overall system. That is going to affect the architecture of your system on chip. Now, the good thing is, is all these companies have offices in Silicon Valley where most of the semiconductor folks reside. Um, and so it's, it's easier nowadays to have those re relationships. But for the semiconductor guys, it's also important for them to have people on staff who really understand this market.
and who maybe have had experience in the automotive market in the past. Kurt Schuler, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks, Ed.